Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the Document Everything panel, where we will be discussing the importance of documentation. Startups with big ideas and plans to disrupt the future can't overlook the little things like the importance of documenting their work, procedures, and project milestones. Getting organized from the get-go is imperative and proves particularly important as a startup scales. We have a great group here from a variety of backgrounds, and I'm very excited to hear their input and experiences. I will let them introduce themselves. Sam, would you like to start? Yes, hello. My name is Sam. I'm at Bank Tech Ventures. I joined the team as assistant to the managing director, and within about a year, I've moved into operations coordinator. So I feel like I'm pretty close to this topic. I deal with a lot of admin and operational management information documentation for a small remote team. We're about nine people. We started at about five people when I joined the team. So we're going to have a lot to talk about in terms of hiring and remote organization and all things, you know, remote teams. So that's kind of my background. Good morning, everybody. Parker Steed with uh, Micronotes.ai. I lead sales and we're also a, a small company. I want to say uh, at this point, 18, half of those are our contractors. And we primarily deal with, with banks and credit unions, looking at both data housed within the FI, as well as data outside the walls of the financial institution and how we use that data in our tech stack to create more meaningful engagement with their consumers. When we talk about writing everything down, documenting everything for a small team, it, it's, it's absolutely critical, although it's more painful in the moment oftentimes. And we think we need to put this fire out uh, right now. It, it's, it's equally important to write down the instructions to put out the next fire Otherwise, you find yourself reinventing or, or, or just losing the efficiency that you get over time, which is even more important for that small team. So looking forward to chatting through some of those practices from what we've been doing and do every day. Great. Thank you both. So during this panel, we'll discuss how to get organized and stay organized and setting the standard for proper documentation. So let's get started. First off, why should I be documenting everything I do? Parker, you started talking about this. So I'll hand it off to you. Yeah, I'll, I'll give that a shot. And before we get too, too much deeper, and I just want to say if Brandon is around, I do think Alejandro might be physically present. Uh, oh, so great. If, I will go find him. So yeah. you guys keep talking. Be on the lookout. Um, yeah, so the, the question is, why is it important, Caitlin and and like I was saying, we have a really small team. And in some cases, there's only one person doing a certain activity. And the, the phrase that's often used is, what if Parker gets hit by a bus? Obviously, that, that's a little morbid. And, and we, we hope that I don't get hit by a bus. But, but realistically, what if something happens, right? And it could, be, it could be really anything. How do we know what Parker does every day It keeps things moving. And if, if Parker gets sick or Parker, literally anything happens, how do we make sure that we can pick up where where he left off and we don't lose all that momentum and, and we don't start dropping critical balls? I mean, that, that's, that's an easy one. I think uh, equally in, important is if you don't know what's going on, it's really hard to improve it. You start thinking about metrics and, and documenting Right. I, I lead sales. So when you think about things like a sales organization and sales ops, what is our what's our, our time to close? What is our uh, th there's there's a thousand metrics you can you can look at to try to improve sales. But think about that across the organization from an improvement and efficiency perspective. You really can't improve something that you don't understand and you can't understand something if you don't document it. Yeah, kind of jumping off of that. Along the process, especially in the early stages of building a team, no matter what your company or product is, like Parker and I come from very different teams where, you know, Bank Tech Ventures is a very small strategic investment fund and ecosystem where we're balancing, you know, 100 bank partners and a growing portfolio, of about 15 companies. So it's going to be chaotic. And in the early stages of anything like this, you're going to make a lot of mistakes maybe not mistakes, but you're going to make a lot of very fast decisions and you really need to be able to go back and see, okay, why did I make this decision? When was this decision made? What were the consequences of this decision? So that, you know, not to 
be mad at yourself and to have regret, but like Parker said, to know how to put out the next fire. And it's, it's just extremely important to be able to look back and not just rely on your own memory to, and like Parker said, the memory of one person. Because if something happens to that one person or if that person leaves, or even just for the sake of ease of growing your team, you want to be able to have everything written down so that when you add people, it's not hours and hours of catching people up and having to refer to the same people for the same things over and over again. Great. We could go on forever. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Sam, in your role as head of operations and all things HR at a startup, what do I need to think about for internal and onboarding documentation? Yeah. So at Bank Tech, we've nearly doubled in size and run two intern classes since I've joined the team. And a huge part of this, especially for us, since we don't have a dedicated, experienced HR professional, I joined the team, you know, with internship experience in HR, but nothing, you know, to a professional level to be any head of HR. So documentation was incredibly important to my processes for onboarding and growing the team. My first piece of, you know, maybe advice or something that I've learned is that having a platform to help you document onboarding and internal documentations for you is a huge first step that will save hours and hours of strategizing and brute labor. For us, we use Gusto. It's a payroll and HR platform. They document so, you know, tax documents, employment documents that can get extremely confusing, especially if you're not very seasoned in doing work like that. So having a platform was very, very important. I recommend Gusto. I'm a huge fan, but there's also Rippling. There's a lot. Um, but the platform was very helpful. And then this kind of folds into my main idea about all of this, you know, documentation organization is that it's a mindset more so than a set of rules or specific strategies. If you're going through your daily process thinking, I'm going to want to be able to remember this in the future and I don't want to have to rely on my memory, that mindset will serve you so well, no matter if you're doing HR, you're doing sales, anything. If you go into it thinking, I want to know exactly what I'm doing right now, 10 months from now, and you, you know, act accordingly, no matter how you do it, that will serve you so well, especially with onboarding and things like that. Great. Alejandro, welcome. Uh, would you mind just introducing yourself really quick? How are you guys? Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. Uh, my name is Alejandro Alvarez, and uh, I'm the CEO and founder of the Event Society. Uh, we do events um, around New England and Miami, um, and yeah, it's just been um, such a great experience all these years through hospitality. So now we serve uh, big, big clients, mostly uh, real estate, uh, corporate events. Uh, we build everything from, you know, um, from 10 to uh, maybe 100 300 people. We have done like a thousand people events as well. So yeah, it's just been such a great, great experience here in Boston. Uh, so now we're excited to be here with you guys. Awesome. All right. I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, so you've created successful startups throughout your career. What types of documentation do I need to think about to even begin creating my business? Um, to be honest with you, like I, I do because, you know, I manage a lot of people like, you know, bartenders, servers, and it's kind of like hard to keep in track sometimes because not everyone reads like, you know, documentation and stuff like that. But um, I do links right now and it's, uh, it's called FreshBooks. FreshBooks is amazing. I do, I post everything there. I do uh, all the, you know, like, the daily timeline and uh, before the event, after the event, all the details and um, and people it's just like easier these days right now just to click on a text and you know instead of like going through a software that probably they don't have, but FreshBooks can give you that uh, advantage. So I think it's one of the best tools that. I, um, you know, I got it since it's just been like 10, 10 months that I got it. And it's just like amazing. It changed my entire experience with my company. That's great. Yeah. You and Sam both alluded to just the importance of documentation for 
to make everyone's lives easier at the company, if you're running the company or just an employee there. So that's great. And we'll get to tools a little bit later too. Yeah. No, and also, uh, I mean, I'm the only one, I'm kind of like small business, but I used to have a business partner right now. And it's just like, I do it all. So I think I have everything under control. Fresh is so easy. You can just, you made a mistake. And you can just fix it in two seconds with your phone. So I think it's great. Yeah, definitely. I know people who work at startups have to wear a lot of different hats. So yeah, and you need to find some good tools. Uh, so pivoting a little bit, Parker, what about external documentation? You work at a Series C's company and now have a large network of clients and investors. So what should I be sharing with customers or external stakeholders? Yeah, I'll answer that. And I also want to just touch on what Sam and Alejandro said, which when you think about hiring, one of the things that we talk about often, myself and our CEO, as we're doing different things, you think of marketing and sales early on, Alejandro mentioned he does everything, right? But long-term as you scale a startup, regardless of which role you're playing, ideally you're taking one of those hats at a time and you are, you are further outlining what that hat looks like, you're, you're coloring in details. We're taking the hat analogy pretty far, but the idea is that each of those hats will become a role in and of itself so we often say, I need to, to prove that I can do this and I can do this successfully, show how it works, and then take that hat and bring on someone else to wear it. And the idea is from a, a, a sales perspective, especially, I need to understand how a product works and be able to go sell it and understand that whole process of selling that thing before I can bring on someone to, to uh, fulfill that sales role. But as a founder, that should be every role in the company you should understand and be able to think through. And that's where documentation comes in play. If you've thought through how that role works, you can bring on someone to take that role or hand that role off to. And the better you document, the easier that handoff is going to be. In terms of external sharing, we work with a lot of sensitive data. We have a, a strategic distribution relationship with Fiserv and we are we're a portfolio company for Experian Ventures as well. What that means is that we have a lot of consumer data that, that's really sensitive and it's critical that from a an InfoSec perspective, we have everything locked down and, and we're that's a constant battle. That that's a never ending battle. For our clients, which happen to be banks and credit unions, for the most part, they're looking at how is all that documentation uh, being stored and and we need access to it from a due diligence perspective. So we use tools like Confluence, for example, and I don't know if we're getting into the weeds of which tools we use, but that, that's one that we use. We also use uh, tools like, uh, we're, we're an Azure shop, so Microsoft is home for a lot of what we do, and we'll share out documents. They, they allow you to share with things like SharePoint, different with different permissions for different people, and something like due diligence documents, really critical that all the compliance folks or the legal folks and, and possibly other teams within an organization can see those. So the sharing the and permissions capabilities are really important for us. And we, we use other tools, but those are, are primarily when, when you think due diligence, make sure everybody understands that you have checked the InfoSec box. We're using, we're using those. Great. And adding on to that, how do you provide consistent messaging and make sure that all employees are on the same page and, you know, making sure messaging isn't construed from person to person, you know, because you want everybody to understand the overall mission of your company. So how do you work to make that messaging consistent? Is that a question for me? Yeah, if you want to start, it could be for oh. anyone who wants to hop in. <laughs> that's, that, that's a good question. I know Sam was mentioning something about this earlier, so I'll, I'll speak briefly and then hand it to her. Um, so we we struggle with this because we're a, a startup that's that's constantly seeing new opportunities with the data coming from Experian. There, we're, we're regularly learning that we didn't know we didn't know about this data and that data, and that changes our, our product roadmap as we listen to to our clients and we try to build uh, and add on in, in a way that is allowing them to continually be more uh, competitive in the marketplace. But those those core ideas are are really important uh, and 
and they shouldn't change all that often. And that's going to come top down from the CEO and, and the executive team. And a lot of those a lot of the, those documents live for us in Confluence and, 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 and again, probably SharePoint, but I'd say more so Confluence and that trickles into, so at, if you think of all the Atlassian products, we're going to, we're going to dive a little deep here. If you're an Atlassian shop, you're using Confluence, I imagine in Jira and, and, and maybe even Trello, some of their other tools, all of that has to be uh, in, in, in a place where the whole company can see it. And as they, they build within those platforms, they're leveraging that same messaging, if you will. And that, that discipline of using those tools and making sure that you're, you're taking that messaging uh, throughout the whole platform, that's going to come from the top. So leadership has to play a huge role in that. Yeah, I, I agree with leadership playing a huge role in kind of consistent messaging across the team. Another part of it is consistency, too, on the part of the leadership team and, you know, heads of departments, if your team is even that big or, you know, across the whole team, it's consistency um, in making sure that everybody's on the same page with why we're here, why, you know, what we're doing, why we're doing it, when this is going to happen, when this is going to happen. Consistency is a huge part of that. And we don't need to harp too long on that because Parker pretty much hit the nail on the head. Great. Thank you, guys. So who should be running point on documenting all of the things we've talked about? I know this is company-wide, but uh, Alejandro, would you like to start? I know that you are kind of the sole owner of your business, but so are you taking on all of these responsibilities? I do. Actually, I, I'm kind of like a, a OCD for, it, for that because I have to make sure that, you know, everything was working under me. They know everything um, behind the scenes, logistically, uh, during the event and after is so much like information. Um, but I think, but I think, uh, you know, right now I have an assistant that I'm training because I, again, you know, we wear all the hats right now, but um, I think, I think, um, I think this, the you know, director, has to be like in charge of everything. I think is that's a first. Yeah, Sam. What about you as head of operations? Or do you find yourself doing most of this documentation or passing on certain responsibilities to other people within the company? So I have thoughts on this, and I I'm going to refer to Brandon, so so <laughs> he'll understand when I say this. I try. So during my first kind of couple months trying to run point for the team on documentation and organization. I tried branding, you know, maybe three or four times to implement a rigid, very structured, very regular, very high maintenance system of documenting our projects and our, our kind of, you know, information as it changes and as it grows. And none of those worked because they came from me and me alone. And it was me imposing them on the rest of the team as they were trying to do what they do. So I found that what works, especially on a team where you're you're working on extremely different things, like, you know, Brandon on our investment team is his day to day life and his, you know, the materials and documents that he works with are extremely different from what I work with. So why do I think that I can create a system that would work for that? You know what I mean? So I think a big part of it, especially it's more possible on, a you know, in a smaller team, but allowing heads of department, however they appear to create their own systems for managing their information and tracking it so that if they go, you know, no one knows their job better than the person doing it. So it, allowing heads of departments and even individual team members, if it makes sense, to create their own systems for documenting what they're doing and documenting their information has worked the best in my experience. And I saw Brandon laughing earlier, the, you know, organization, we use Notion a lot of times for our internal kind of uh, headquarters for where we keep a lot of our processes. Brandon's built out the most, you know, incredible information hub for, you know, the bank tech team. And I couldn't have done that <clears throat> because it's not what I do every day. And so that's kind of the lesson I took away from those trial and errors in the beginning of my time at bank tech is that you got to let people create what they create and help them and get them to do it. But nobody knows their job and what they're doing better than the person doing it. So sometimes it's easier to pass the baton of documenting things to the person who's doing it 
and allow them to create a system that's easy to keep up with, that they understand, that they know the rest of the team can understand. And then, you know, once they have it, it folded in to the rest of the team's documentation system. That so is Sam. Yeah. Sam, just to kind of pull on that thread for a second, I'm just curious, are you setting time every week, month to reassess, you know, document, um, adapt certain protocols or procedures you have in place? Or, or is it more on the fly? Like how, because it's hard, right? To Alejandro's point, you're doing everything at once. So it's hard to sit down and say, okay, for the next two hours, I'm going to sit down and write all this out. So how can I incorporate this into maybe a more of a routine? Yeah, that's a great question. It kind of goes back Back to what I said earlier about this whole thing being more of a mindset than a rigid structure, where if a problem comes up and the problem was either caused or exacerbated by poor documentation, that is the moment that you fix it. You don't you don't say, OK, I'll get to this, you know, during my monthly you know, two hours that I spend on documentation. That's not realistic because so many problems come up. It's it's you, it has to be a mindset that you're dedicated to pretty consistently so that you're willing to readjust your systems. If something comes up, readjust it right then or an hour later if you can. And, you know, on on the fly, I'd say, is how is how it works in a team are small, in a team as small as ours and as chaotic as ours. Yeah. Can I just add on to, to that? I'd say that is is cultural, at least for us it's been cultural. So everything Sam is saying in and I know Carrie is very encouraging and supportive of of everyone's autonomy and he trusts people and and Sam can then go do what she needs to do. For us culturally, what I've seen is that if if our CEO or others on the executive team aren't valuing whatever that thing is, it's really difficult to get it done or get other people to do it. And the example that I, I like to use is something like Salesforce. So we use Salesforce, but Anybody with a sales team or, or trying to sell a product will likely have some type of CRM. And if leadership or or the leaders of the company aren't using those tools, it's really difficult for everybody else to get in the habit of logging regularly. And Brandon asked a question, when do you do that? If you have a, a demo with somebody or some type of prospect meeting, it for me, I I do immediately after that that time with that prospect. I book time on my calendar to sit down and write out everything I need. And our client success team does something similar because the next time I get on and I'm going to, I'm going to call that prospect, I need to know everything that's happened. And it's really, really difficult if you're not super disciplined, like Sam said, in that moment, when it happens, document it. You, when you put it on the to-do list with a small team, there's just no way it happens, right? It, because, because there's, constant fires uh, every moment of the day if you don't if you don't document it right then and it's not culturally important it's really difficult to to uh, we we do another thing like this it, we have a, a a complex problem solving session uh, every every week and we painstakingly sit down as, as a company and think about problems and we we write out not just problem statements, but root causes before we ever talk about solutions. But that is a, a culturally driven, everyone left to their own devices probably wouldn't do something like that. But because it comes from, from the top, uh, we're forced to sit down and think about these things, document them, and ultimately create better solutions. Um, and so it, where that, that's helpful. The other thing, granted, again, on the time, the, the timing, as a, as a leadership team, we take a second before the week starts to to talk about last week and the week coming and and do somewhat of a personal planning session but uh send out a recording to the rest of the leadership team about what's what happened and, and what's going to happen so that we're all in sync even if we can't meet together some people are on planes or trains or automobiles and everybody's busy but hearing what's going on that component of documentation although it's it's not necessarily being written so people can refer back to it you certainly could it certainly keeps everybody in sync and it's it's a discipline that as tough as it may be sometimes uh, it keeps the team together yeah um no i was just, i totally agree with you and um my in my case because i i don't have any employees i just hire by event 
So I think, um, you know, just as you say, just like meeting, calling people, texting, you know, using different, um, you know, just like uh, methods of communication with them. So keeping them posted with everything, I think is, um, I know it's typical sometimes, but um, yeah, you have to keep on it. I, I mean, that's that's what I do with them. And um, yeah, totally. Yeah, especially in such a virtual and remote world, how have you guys found that documentation has helped when the team is entirely virtual, when you can't have those in-person meetings and everything has to be written down on the computer? <clears throat> you get very uh, reliant on your systems. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, in, my, in my case, I, again, you know, I try to use emails um, through our software that it works pretty well. But how am I going to make sure that you are reading it? And how am I going to make sure that you are on time or, you know, your delay or whatever? Uh, and the software that I use, it gives you notifications and just to my, me and my team. So now I know who's, I know it kind of sounds weird, but I know who's not reading it, who's not reading it. So I just, you know, I, I, I think it's such a great tool to save a lot of time um you know um i i think it's uh, one of the best tools that i have I, i'll just say one of the interesting bonuses of being virtual i, I think covid played a big role in, in moving people to this idea of hey let's consider remote let's consider it differently and, and it, it made some changes that for some people are, are longer lasting than others. And everybody at least has considered how they want to operate in terms of remote, non-remote. But in a sales role, I remember during COVID, there were moments when I thought salespeople have been doing remote work for, for the last, I mean, forever, right? That That's the nature of a lot of sales roles. We work, like I said, with, with Fiserv. And I remember early on going out and spending time with account reps, you know, in, in the trenches going and, and meeting with prospects. And I thought, yeah, I, I'm already, I, I'm already remote. So that was, that was not necessarily an enlightening thing. However, what, what's helpful is now when you get back to the office, if you will, for me, it, it, it's still never in the actual office or maybe once a year. But the benefit or the bonus of that is that when I, when we have water cooler chat, Caitlin or, or Sam or Mahondro, I am on my computer. I, I can I can call you on Teams for whatever it may be, or whatever tool you you use, Skype, whatever, or Zoom. But I can I can with a click of the button, we're we're water cooler chatting, right? But I've also got Confluence up right next to me, and as we talk about strategy or what's going on with this client. I've also got Salesforce and I can document this is what we're doing or this is what we'd like to do, or I can draft the email as we're talking about it. And now an idea that would have happened over a snack might still happen over a snack. You'll, you'll find me eating on most calls, uh, drinking on this call today, but uh, coffee, not, not alcohol. Uh, <laughs> but, but on, on, on most, on, in most calls, I'm eating something. I'm usually uh, finding opportunities to, to get calories in and, actually drafting up that next thing that will get shipped and logged in, in a couple different places. But that's the beauty in my mind of a virtual world. You can get work done in real time instead of back to Sam's point, putting it on your to-do list and, oh yeah, we had that great idea. Let's, let's book another meeting to talk through that and maybe put something together and then get it. And now it takes two weeks instead of 20 minutes to get that thing shipped. That, that's been really, really productive for us. Yeah, I think there's there's two sides to this remote conversation. There's the spontaneity side, which is what Parker just touched on. And then there's the intentionality side, which is a little bit of a burden that is put on remote teams because there is no water cooler talk. There's no passing each other in the hallway. We all know this. It's a tale as old as time since COVID. But I have found that being intentional with communicating with the team, especially where I am kind of at the center of the team, going outwards to everybody doing their independent things is having one-on-ones with every team member once a week 
and intention it's it's almost like intentional water cooler talk so that you can get on the same page not only with what you're working on you know documentation wise organization wise but also on a personal team building level it's been really valuable to me to create that office feeling in a remote environment it's it's not easy but if you dedicate the time to it and plan for it it's really valuable I do want to, I just want to jump in because I want to flip the script on Caitlin real quick, but Sam and I have a weekly conversation and we talk about trash TV for about an hour. It's pretty great. Um, Caitlin, I'm wondering, you joined our team back in January or so and kind of had to get up to speed on your own because we're, to Sam's point, we're running around different directions. So let me ask you, from your perspective and onboarding yourself, really, how was that process and what do you wish you had gotten more out of? that process, whether it was certain documents, certain things that you knew, wish, you know, now that you wish you knew the first day and how can some of the founders in the room make sure that their new hires are, they can essentially onboard themselves within 48 hours. Well, I can't take all the credit for onboarding myself, Brandon, you did do a great job. Um, it's not, dude, I'm talking to you, 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 <laughs> you, you answer for you. Um, so the team did have a lot of stuff around the missions and the goal of the company and a lot of the, so I joined on the investment side of the team. And so the uh, ways that we went about the investment process, a lot of that stuff was written out, which was nice, but you know, it's different than actually doing the work. So I think that it, a lot of it just takes time and experience to get up to speed on things, but also asking questions of other people. And I think that, you know, procedures and policies were established just by saying, hey, how does this work? And then someone thought, someone made the realization like, oh, we should write this down. And so definitely, I, if you're bringing on someone new, ask them, say, what am I missing? What do you wish you knew more about? And then establish, uh, you know, just a document about that certain procedure, that how, how you guys conduct that. Um, for the most part, you know, maybe if there was a list of the different tools that we did use and the purpose for those tools, I think that could have been helpful. Um, you know, also, yeah, I think just to, to list it out, but a lot of our procedures were pretty well documented. I think Notion was a great tool to break out all the teams and all the companies we were working with. But yeah, definitely listen to the employees that you guys bring on because I think that they'll point out little things that you may have not noticed. Thank you, Caitlin. I am adding tools and their uses to my onboarding procedure for our next employee. So thank you. Awesome. And on the topic of tools, I see a question in the chat. Um, you guys have mentioned a couple of different tools throughout the panel. I know, Alejandro, you said FreshBooks, uh, Salesforce, Notion. Can you guys talk about the cost of these different tools? FreshBooks is literally um, $25 a month. Unbelievable. So, wow. and also, um, I use another one uh, to write all the contracts and everything because, you know, I do it all, but uh, it's called Grammar. So, it fixes everything, all the documents. So, I combine them both, and that's what I do. You know, it's just 10 bucks plus PC, I mean, uh, 25, and, you know, you're not paying $1,000 a month for uh, software. Very easy to manage though. That's great. So for the uh, HR kind of platforms that I was talking about, it really depends on the size of your team and what services you need from them versus not. But, and I would have to go into Gusto to see how, how much we are actually paying because since the team has grown, it's changed. But things like Notion, it's for us, it's about $1,000 a year um, for a Notion license with, you know, 15 people. And I think that is extremely worth it to have a reliable, you know, very easy user-friendly source of truth to write down our policies and practices and keep documents. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, the way that we decide whether or not to execute on something that will cost the team money. I think it, it's, it has to be contextual. It has to be how many hours of time would this save us which is another great exercise that you could do to get a little bit more aware of how, how much time you're spending on processes like this. How much time will this save us? What will that free time become for us? And is the cost worth it to get that benefit? And it's, it's extremely contextual and on a per team basis, in my opinion. 
Yeah, we have someone on the team who's uh, exploring different AI tools for Zoom meetings. So they'll sit in and they'll take notes on the meetings and some tools will break it out by action items and main points. And so we had him test out a few different tools, find the pricing structure for each of them. And we're currently in the process of deciding what's worth it for our team and who needs to be using it. Yeah. I'll just plug one AI tool that we're using right now that is along the lines of documenting, but does some other neat things. It's called Poised and it will, it can help with recording meeting notes, but also coaches you as a speaker how to remove things like filler words, making sure your pace is right on. And, and I found that very helpful for anybody who's client facing. So we're similarly looking at tools like that to help increase the, the quality of what we're producing as a team using AI. In terms of cost of tools for us, Salesforce, the, the pricing is fairly public, but to Sam's point, we do a lot of thinking around what are we doing today that's, that costs us a lot of time that Salesforce could help us reduce. And when you look at something like Salesforce, there's probably unlimited features for everything. It, it's it's obviously a massive platform, but something like Inbox, that makes my life a lot easier when I'm thinking about documenting. Again, if I'm gonna send an email to somebody, I wanna make sure my CRM is integrated into my, we use Outlook, whatever you're using for email. So it's one click versus copying, pasting, polling, going and finding the account. All of that's done automatically. And it's it's not just the, the cost of my time to figure out how to go get that and, and make sure it's documented. It's the the mental switching costs between activities, which is really, really tough. And there are tools, like I said, Salesforce Inbox is one that I find very helpful in terms of you're, you're bringing in things like calendaring, uh, automating that, you're bringing in things like documenting emails as they go out and making sure they're attached to the right opportunity, the right account but also things like engagement. You've got tools out there, whether it's outreach or, or uh, all sorts of sequencing tools when you think about sales, outbound sales efforts. Salesforce obviously has their own set of tools and something we looked at just recently was sales engagement. And and that's a whole, a whole nother set of, of tools that, that roll up into that. But we're looking at that from both a client success and an outbound sales perspective to say, how much time is being spent and can we make one human look like three while documenting everything in Salesforce. So the next time I go pull that account up, I can see everything that's happened. And that's, that's the beauty of having it all in one place, but also automating some of that documentation. You're, you're enabling one person to do the work of a lot more. And that's one thing that we think a lot about when we think about those tools and the cost back to Sam's point is the cost going to enable us to, to function as if we had three more FTEs. And in that sense, it, it's really, really inexpensive. I also what I did. Um, uh, I struggled before booking clients, kind of like the calls and all the details that, you know, I managed like all the vendors from A to Z, so including food and cocktails. So it's a lot of kind of like in a call is it's a lot. So what I did is uh, created a. Um, event request form through my website and again links literally it just i just send a link and my clients fill that out and then now i don't have to call them because i already have the information so uh, that can like save me a little bit too a lot of time a lot of time so uh it's educating clients and stuff like that so, you know, it's cool. yeah definitely yeah it's hard it's hard obviously but Hey, I'm curious for you guys on the pricing question. Have you seen a lot of these new deals? Not so much new, but they're coming a little bit more um, trending up, I should say, where they offer startup preferential pricing on some of these platforms and then it ramps up pretty quickly on them. So it might be like a 90% discount day one. And then after year two, it jumps up to you know, 50% and then you're paying full price. I guess as like a bootstrap founder or an early stage founder, Three years is not really that long of a time, right? And uh, it might become cost prohibitive at some point. So how should founders think about these deep discounts to get them on board? Yeah, to your point, Brandon, the way I'm thinking about it and in, in the work we do, three years is not a long time. Our sales cycles with 
really, really conservative companies happen to be relatively long. We think a lot about how long we, th we think we'll be using that tool. And the, the discounted pricing is helpful to try it. But if it's something like a Confluence, for example, where the switching cost is going to be massive, we're, we're thinking about the pricing in terms of that, that longer term and, and saying, okay, we know the price tag will be X two and a half years from now. That's the price we're thinking about when we do that cost analysis, because we know that as, as easy as everyone might pitch it to be switch from one tool to another, if you've, if you've had, you know, a handful or, or three or four times a handful of employees every day document in a, in a tool like that, it's near possible to make a clean switch. From yeah. In that same kind of vein, uh, thinking about the future and incorporating these tools and what they're going to cost into any future financial projections or what your team is willing to allocate towards internal communication and documentation is super important. But I think getting clarity from these platforms about what their actual cost will be down the line is really important. Um, and then if, if the price ramp up seems like something like Parker said, after you do that cost benefit analysis, it's okay to say no to a tool and to keep going the way you were going before until you find something else that makes more sense for you and your team. Um, but that is unfortunately the reality of a lot of these tools is that they're, they offer startup pricing. And then as soon, you know, for us, for Gusto, employing uh, a team across state lines is now exponentially more expensive than it was about two years ago for us. And that's just unfortunately a reality of a growing team and using these platforms past their, you know, discounted rate. It's unfortunate reality, but it's one that you can deal with if you plan accordingly. Are these platforms holding on to the information for you or are you storing your information somewhere else? Because obviously you're taking in so much every single day. And then on that note, how long are you holding on to that information or those documents for? Is there a certain cadence or are there any best practices that I should know of? Depends on the partner. You want to go for it? <laughs> I'll, I'll make it quick. I would say it depends on the sensitivity of the information. Some things are absolutely under lock and key and and no one no one or at least there's a very limited set of folks that that can access that that data when you think more about writing down non-sensitive process type information and that that's really important for us we spend a lot of time like i said before on infosec there isn't necessarily a cap to that and we rely on on the those hosted services for those platforms where we're documenting documenting everything yeah I was going to say something very similar. It depends on who's using which platforms and what they need. And if, if they, you know, it, it sounds very simple and, you know, straightforward, but we do, we use Salesforce at Bank Tech. And um, there are certain members of the team that are on Salesforce every single day, multiple times a day. So the documents that they need in order to do their work will live on Salesforce. Whereas I'm not in Salesforce every single day, all day, like other members of the team are. So I wouldn't keep my documents there. I would keep them, you know, in our, other, you know, Notion, Google, wherever we, and I think the most important part of this is it sounds bad to have everything separated like that, but as to Parker's point, being intentional about who has access to what information is a huge part of this, like privileged access to certain folders, you know, not everyone on the team has access to the same HR documents that I do, and that's all very intentional. Um, but allowing it to kind of happen organically, similar to what I was saying earlier about allowing heads of departments to kind of create their own documentation processes, especially in the early stage, it will make things a lot easier to allow things to unfold and develop as they naturally do, and then guiding it with a little bit of intentionality and hard work is you know, the easiest way to go. The only, the only thing I'll add to that to what Sam just said, Caitlin, is that it is helpful. I think we're all intending to build a, a great big business, right? That's the idea of a startup is we, we, we get a good idea. We start to build that out. And ideally, we, we get to this place where we're trying to scale that really quickly. And we want to scale as large as possible. Thinking about this idea that there isn't a cap on how long we'll keep some of this information, 
you can see where after two, three, four, five years and employee count multiplied by 100, all of a sudden things get really, really messy. And to Sam's point, that is some of the beauty of organically separating things. It's really helpful to be able to go to any prospect or client in Salesforce and see the whole process from start to finish. See documents like proposals, contracts across various opportunities, all of those interactions, both from the sales and client success team. But also thinking about a tool like Confluence or any type of internal wiki type tool and thinking longer term, somebody with more of an architectural mind should be thinking about data organization and structure across the team and how we're storing that so that three years from now, it's not impossible to find anything because that's a problem that we've run into in different cases. Wait a second, this this is a mess. What happened? Who wasn't thinking in the beginning about long-term structure and organization? Absolutely. Yeah. Alejandro, I'm sure you have a lot of contracts between all the different industries that you work in. Is there, uh, are you storing these documents for a certain number of years or um, indefinitely? How do you go about that? Um, I mean, I do keep them, obviously, but um, I mean, that's what I like about this software that I use that you can just like not they're not in your email, you know, you, you don't have them in your computer, you just have, it's like an iCloud, you know, so everything is like, you want to just click on a client, pass clients, it saves everything. Um, but I think, um, you know, before, I mean, it, it was a different story, but right now, I think it's just, you know, I think it's much better to keep them on, on um, somewhere that you can just like go somewhere. But yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, that wraps up all of my questions. Brandon, are there any questions in the crowd that I would like to ask? Well, if not, I have a couple of questions too, but I do have one. So give me one second. Okay. There you are. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, our speakers, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, on documentation as well as the tools. Uh, you mentioned about some AI tools. I wonder whether there are some cross-channel AI tools out there that would allow you to capture uh, conversations that are happening in different channels, say Notion or Team or Microsoft or emails or Slack. And, and uh, the AI tool will be able to learn from these interactions and uh, sort of come up with uh, the best practices and automatically record that uh, for the whole company to, to benefit from. Uh, that's, that's my quick question. Are there AI tools cross channels? I can speak for, for us. We aren't using anything right now that would consume all of that different data. And, and what I'm what I'm hearing is take all the different tools we use and and somehow aggregate that data and then using I don't know if it's like a large language model or or, or something along those lines to start seeing if, if we can find patterns um, uh, across the, the information. I think that's the question. We're not using anything like that today and, I, and we haven't seen anything so. We're open to, if, if anybody else has one that they're using, we're certainly open to looking at it. What we are doing is we're using AI to help with things like documentation and improving documentation. For example, proposals, contracts, even creating uh, collateral for our clients as we think about how to improve some of the things we've already built, using AI to take that, whether it's, it's verbiage or imaging, uh, improve and and help uh, in, in terms of creation in the future, automating and, and simplifying. I there there are. Oh, go ahead, Caitlin. There is a tool called Zapier, and it you can build custom workflows. So, for example, if you have a conversation within Slack or your Google email, you can connect that to Salesforce and all these different um, tools that you use. So that is a big one that I've heard about. Um, Brandon, what were you going to say? I know there's other connections you can make. Yeah, we, we, funny enough, it's an area of investment thesis for us that we've been diving into. Um, 
And there's a couple that immediately come to mind, don't necessarily do the exact thing you're asking, but we're testing out a, a company called 4PM that listens to your conversation on a Zoom meeting. So it could be across any of these channels you're talking about, notes, everything being said with action items, follow-ups, segment, segments it out based on the topic of conversation, you can understand the t- context, and then you can implement it into your CRM so you can track those notes right in real time and everyone can see what's going on. Or the other area that we're kind of looking into is, especially when you're starting to figure out your process documentation, and you're not sure where to start two companies one's called scan.ai and one's called huloop you could let's say you have a daily task that you do as part of some sort of process you can have it track your keypad as you're going through the process itself and it can also record you and it will build a process for you in real time that you can then share with the next employee so rather than taking the time out of your day to write down each step you actually have a full video and breakdown of it that comes along with an automated documentation that it generates in real time to teach the next person how to do it. Because let me ask you this, how many founders that are in the room feel comfortable taking a two week vacation and not touching their email or any part of their business? Yeah, exactly. Zero, right? Like there's not a chance because you don't, there's a key person issue there, right? Because you don't feel comfortable either because you don't feel comfortable delegating or you not you don't have the resources available to have that person be able to jump in your shoes right then and there. Right. So but that our thesis in this regard is to get rid of that problem altogether. Right. So you can go to Bora Bora, you can go to Fiji, whatever you want to do for two weeks. One, one thing I'll say to that, to that same question in terms of polling and documenting using AI, one thing that, we've done on the sales side there's a company called apollo that will they do a lot of different things but one of the things they do is they'll record calls and you can take a snippet of that call and then distribute it across various emails so when you're thinking about a a, an individual prospect where you're doing a demo and there's a bunch of back and forth and it's tailored to them then that's recorded i can take the the key 15 minutes of that call and share it across the different attendees and they can share that across the organization so now it's it's not just a demo, but it's a tailored demo that they're sharing internally. If that's helpful. Anyone else have any questions in the room here? Oh, we got one in the back. One sec. Hello. Thank you, panel. My name is Kevin. I've been learning a little bit about blockchain recently. And does anyone have any experience with blockchain, how it can apply to documenting um, across one company or multiple companies even. Thank you. I'm happy I can I'm happy to jump in, guys, if you guys want a minute to think. Yeah. Um so the big thing most DLT and blockchain technology is not accessible to the average person or the average business. The one area or two areas that become a little bit more interesting right now Smart contracts, right, showing who actually owns something out there. I know it's big in Southeast Asia, especially when they have a lot of cargo shipments of different various items. It's usually manual paperwork that they're dealing with, and that paperwork gets lost or stolen or something happens where it's unclear who owns what. And so they've been leveraging a lot of blockchain technology to show ownership of assets, which has been really interesting and has saved these companies countless dollars in legal costs fighting for it the other one that's becoming a little bit more accessible is in the payment space right especially with everyone talking about real-time payments and and fed now if you're familiar with this area but it's going to affect a lot of small businesses that want real-time payments back and forth especially if they have overseas suppliers what have you and the question around it is okay that's fine you can have another payment rail that goes along with checks or ach or wires that you might be familiar with but there's a lot of fraud on those existing rails. And if you're gonna tell me that the settlement time is basically zero from when I launch a transaction to when it closes, it's probably gonna be a lot more fraud. So can you leverage blockchain or DLT to better mitigate risk in a transaction, right? Which will be huge for a lot of small businesses. Now, 
our team doesn't think it's going to be that accessible to most people, to most businesses for another five years more or so, um, because it's a big learning curve, but it is something to keep an eye on. So as it relates to document processing, I mean, all that documentation is processed and uh, created in real time, right? It's a, a tokenized smart contract shows you exactly where the asset is, tells you who owns it, tells you where the transaction pro is processing. So that's great and should work really well. It just, I think we're just as a society, a little slow to the curve right now because we got to get through a lot of legacy systems first. I'll add on to that, Brandon, that it's expensive. The one thing that when you think about things like NFTs and some of the other applications, it, it's, it's very costly. And that's one of the things that as a, from a sustainability perspective, we think about, but also just from a, a cost perspective, if you're going to scale something, you have to think about the value of, of what you're storing. And in some cases, obviously, there's there's really, really sensitive information you need to be careful with. There are already a lot of really solid tools in place for that. But then the non-sensitive information or less sensitive, which is going to be a lot more of that documentation, it's, it's a question of how much are we willing to spend to make that hyper, hyper, hyper secure? And is is it really... Is, is the cost benefit analysis really going to tell us that that's the way to go in terms of blockchain? So we're coming up on time here. Anyone else have any last questions? Great. Well, thank you so much, panel. Appreciate you, Parker, Sam, Alejandro, Caitlin. Um, I'll start off.